sure. Hello, and I think we just connected. So hello and welcome to PON webinar on how to include marginalized and vulnerable people in risk communication and community engagement. I'm Parvez Khan, Assistant Professor of Journalism Department in Kohat University of Science and Technology. Uh, I am a SUSI Fellow and I participated in SUSI for Scholars Journalism Program in 2018. Uh, the US mission in Pakistan in collaboration with Pakistan US Alumni Network, which is PON, has launched a virtual series of discussions and topics and themes catering to the needs and interest of more than 29,000 alumni across Pakistan. And today we'll be focusing on the marginalized communities and community engagement. Uh, we have three panelists from diverse fields that includes today that uh, that are Dr. Amir Taj Sab, which is who's a Fulbright Fellow, Associate Professor, Institute of Management Sciences, and he's from Puan KB chapter. Uh, we have Abhi Akram, she's a Dis Disability Leadership Professional Exchange alumna, uh, Coordinator Asia Pacific Women with Disability and Coordinator uh, South Asia Disability and Development Initiative, which is SADDI project. Uh, she's from Puan Islamabad chapter. And the last panelist we have uh, is Mavish Ali Khan. She is IVLP alumna, uh, also a lecturer at Fast University of Peshawar. And she's the founder of uh, Rana Child Welfare Foundation uh, from Puan KP chapter. So we have quite uh, diverse uh, panelists today will be speaking on different issues. So I welcome you all, uh, those who've joined us on Facebook and different chapters, uh, welcome once again. Uh, well, it's great having you all here. Uh, Dr. Amir Taj Saab is here with us today, and uh, he has worked in various capacities, both as an academician and development sector. And we would like to have his academic perspective on the marginalized and vulnerable people, uh, and especially uh, that's related to risk communication and community engagement. So my first question from uh, Dr. Saab uh, is, uh, is that, how can we develop an understanding about the marginalized and vulnerable people, particularly in the context of Pakistan, uh, which groups or individuals are vulnerable and at risk? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Praveen. It's a pleasure being here with all of you today. Um, Pakistani society, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is a very highly fragmented and heterogeneous society. Uh, usually, this uh, you know diversity in in, in population it is usually a positive demographic feature in most of the societies, but here in Pakistan, it is so unfortunate that this heterogeneity is quite alarming because uh, there's a huge uh, income and uh, social disparity uh, over here. Um, we can go on into the details of why this is the case, but uh, to make things simpler as, uh, you know, for the, for the time being, I would, I would suggest that it's primarily because of the economic polarization that has resulted in social disparity. There are multiple social groups that are marginalized uh, from political, social, and economic uh, mainstream. Uh, for example, women and children, people with disability, and most important of all, religious minorities and the people who are living dwellers of uh, rural peripheries. So these are some of the, you know, um, uh, notable and quite uh, evident uh, marginalized groups in our society. Unfortunately, a great deal of Pakistani society youth in particular have become a part of one of the groups lately in this post COVID scenario as well. So this has just added um, you know, fuel to the fire. Now, this is quite an alarming situation, as I said a while ago, because Pakistani population is quite young. And in economic recession, the type of economic recession that we're going through right now, the youth of Pakistan is going to be affected very highly. Um, and I say this because their employability prospects are diminished to a, great, uh, to a greater extent. So that's the you know, scenario so far. All right. And uh, particularly, we want to know about that uh, uh, how do you see the role of academia here in the context of uh, community engagement? And obviously, you've done your master's in public policy and your PhD is also in local governments. We would like to know about uh, this issue in that context as well. Sure. Um, I think um, from a broader perspective, when I look at the issues in general, I mean, at the national level and, of course, at the regional level as well, uh, I believe the major, you know, the only solution to this problem is development of private sector. I know we are talking about multiple aspects of vulnerability, but uh, the root cause, as I mentioned a while ago, comes from the economic uh, recession and economic disparity. So these are all interconnected uh, issues. Uh, I think 
you know, the solution that has to come from the government policies is the development of private sector. Now, um, a great deal of youth, as I said a while ago, are aspiring to work for public sector. I've been dealing with young people for the last 15 years. I teach uh, at a public sector university. And every second or third student that I talk to is uh, somehow a PCS or CSS aspirant. And uh, you know they're, they're looking forward to have a permanent job in the public sector. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't blame them because that's the only option available to them in the absence of uh, job opportunities and employment opportunities in social sector and in the private sector. Most of the young people are you know, focusing too much on the public sector. Now, public sector, as we all know, have a, has a very limited capacity to accommodate uh, you know, employees. So that is one of the wrong directions in which uh, our society is moving. Uh, social sector and private sector have shrunk considerably. We all know that very recently, whereas the workforce in the market has increased almost at the same pace. Uh, so in order to reduce economic and social disparities, the federal government, the provincial governments, I believe they must stimulate, they must uh, come up with ideas and they must come up with government initiatives that would eventually help in stimulating the economy. And this can be done by promoting and encouraging entrepreneurship opportunities and, of course, development of private sector. Um, in this regard, I think investments are needed in agricultural sector and corporate sector. We all know Pakistan has a huge population and we cannot depend solely on public sector for our uh, you know, survival, for our economic uh, progress and survival. As far as the social aspect of vulnerability is concerned, which I said, uh, is directly connected with economic disparity. I think the values of uh, tolerance and forbearance, they're supposed to be inculcated in the minds of our children and young people at the very basic education institutions. Uh, <clears throat> curriculum development, I think, is very important and teacher training programs are very important. They're need of the day, I would say. Um, our government has focused primarily on higher education development but at the same time, it is so unfortunate that the government policies and you know, initiatives, they have ignored the importance of basic education and imparting technical and vocational training programs and skills development. So that is something that is quite missing. Uh, social sector is there to help government in reintegrating the vulnerable communities. But over here, what we've seen is that the government is relying solely on social sector to take care of the, 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 the services uh, and the you know, no, no, social inclusion policies to the social sector. So government is kind of um, you know, uh, exonerating itself from this, this key responsibility. And they must ensure that social inclusion is, is ensured through the laws and the policies and government uh, initiatives. Um, so yeah, primarily focusing on the basic education. That's that's the key. key. All right. I think you you highlight key points, just particularly about the public sector. That public sector alone is not enough. And the major issue that concerns us all when it comes to vulnerability is economics. I mean, economics drives everything else. And it, it's it, if class difference comes because of economics, everything else, vulnerability, the risk, all these factors. So you made some key points. Now we are moving towards our next panelist, and our next panelist for today is Abhi Akram. Uh, the Disability Leadership uh, Professional Exchange Program alumna. Uh, Abhiya, first of all, I would like to know, and we would like to know Kez, about your struggle first. Did your personal experiences motivate you to raise voice, voice for the underprivileged? And what was the driving force behind your struggle? Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and having me in this important discussion. Because when we talk about the vulnerable groups, especially in this current scenario, persons with all the vulnerabilities and the marginalized group face so much. We have been struggling from last two, three decades on the right for young people, old people, or other widows, and all the marginalized groups. But really for persons with disability because we have like uh, established an organization back in 1997 and I would say like 10 to 15 percent of the total population are persons with disability which is a huge huge number and we are 
hardly visible or engaged in the overall development of the country as uh, uh, amritaj mehra sahab mentioned about like economically they are not empowered and they are not getting all the equal opportunities that's why they are more marginalized or more confined in the homes for me like it's been like 30 years of experience because since the day i born and uh, started communicating in a community i found there were two extremes like people uh, thought like i'm the punishment from god or maybe very close to allah that's why people always try to respect or protect over protection kind of thing so we were completely excluded from the society it's not only about me but the people who are at the grassroots level who never come out of their homes imagine like their life was always a struggle because they have to talk about their rights their personal life and people accept them as human being um like in that situation when i started my work i thought like this is really important how we are reducing these barriers in their way because when we started the work the first barrier was uh, the infrastructural barriers because if i want to go out on my wheelchair i always think about the people who will carry carry me up who will assess me who will take me outside the transportation is not accessible and all so we started working with different uh, organizations stakeholders government and all the different sectors to just to reduce these barriers the barriers of communication the barriers of infrastructure and the biggest barrier is policy and the legislation which is not inclusive at all so in that situation it was really hard to work on the rights of women and girls with disability and overall on the persons with disability for me as you are like the driving force behind it it's all about my work and meeting with thousands of women and girls with disability i owe a lot on them because every day we talk to them they were like challenges they faced and they discuss that and they come up with the like suggestions how we can move forward why we are sitting why we are facing you know last 10 years just observing the things in the disability movement in the gender movement we are not getting the leadership roles so how we can collectively raise our voice and try to bring the concerns on the table where we can get the support and we were very blessed like with the support of us embassy we have organized all these exchange programs where we took persons with disability to the us and they personally experienced what kind of laws they have what kind of accessibility infrastructure accessibility they have so how they struggled with making the change and bringing an inclusive society for everyone so why not we can do it it took them maybe 10 20 years but for us it's so quick because we can have good examples from the us they have the american disability act so we can start working on the pakistan disability act so what of our exchange program was focusing on the legislation and the policies so we took some parliamentarians some disabled people organizations with us to the us and we learned about the laws in the us and after coming back we presented the bill in the parliament that's the first ever legislation on disability rights from the perspective of the human rights like how we can equal opportunities for everyone so yes i think you made you made a very good point your personal struggle makes a uh, very significant impact because the way you talked about god the discourses the narratives the people make that is it a punishment or is it uh, an imtihan or what sort of things are happening to disabled people but the communication is the most important thing as you just highlighted that the exposure uh, knowing about the legislation around the world help you come around it and now it also depends on communication when it comes to disabled rights or people with difficulties because what we normally do is that we we don't let them speak we speak from our our point of view even our coverages media coverages are our point of view it's it's only when we focus on their point of view 
I think that's going to make a significant difference. I think uh, while we are going live, I mean, those who've joined us, they can think about the questions. We'll be taking questions towards the end. So yes, you can think about the questions and we're taking towards the end. My next question for you, very brief one, if you can answer is that, how difficult is it for women with disabilities? Is there a stigma? You just said about, you spoke about it, but are the discourses changing? Uh, I mean, I would like to know about that. Are there concerns still there? Yeah, I feel like being a woman in Pakistan and then disability and then other marginalization, it's so much discrimination they are facing. We have witnessed those women who are facing the gender-based violence, harassment, sexual harassment, and it's not reported or addressed this issue because they are completely confined in the homes. There is no social protection mechanism where we can address the concerns of women and girls with disability. So uh, definitely women with disabilities facing all that discrimination, but still we thought like if we bring them out of their homes, we have this network and from last 10 years, we are struggling to bring the voices of women with disabilities on the mainstream organizations. And if we move and bring their communication skills and how we can empower that, definitely it can make a change and we'll see a positive visibility of women and girls with disability. Okay. Uh, our next panelist is Mawish Ali Khan. She's Ivil P. Alumna and she's also a lecturer at Fast University of Peshawar and also the founder of Rana Child Welfare Foundation. We've already given brief uh, description about her profile as well. But Mawish, you have initiated a skill development center for women and you have also worked closely uh, out of school children and uh, the street children. You have a better understanding of risk that concerns children. Can you tell us about those risks? What, how vulnerable they are, and if proper measures are not taken? Um, so basically, it's Rana Child Welfare Foundation, which is which means Pashto, which means yeah. light in Pashto. Yeah. So uh, um, yeah, basically, we work with children, and these are out of school children um, or victims of child labor, or you know, uh, street beggars or child uh, vendors, people like that. Um, and apart from that, um, there is some part of my organization, we work with underprivileged girls, especially um, uh, helping them in, in becoming financially empowered, just as uh, Sarah Mirtaj mentioned about financial empowerment. So um, I, I also strongly believe that it's, it is uh, financial empowerment which can actually help um, our population. So we, we work with these women. Um, what we have done is we have developed a skill um, a development center at our school where we teach these uh, girls simple skills like stitching um, and making them up to the market and you know according to the demands and then uh, currently we're trying to give them a digital platform through which they can you know display their skill on digital platform and sell their products uh, according to uh, demands so uh, but because primary focus is on street children and out of school children Obviously, there are different issues that they are facing, um, and especially uh, in in the in this era of COVID, the issues have increased. Uh, but my personal, um, I don't know, this is how my brain works. But I personally believe that we should focus more on solutions because we already know the problems; they are always there. And you know, repeating them it just depresses you, or you know, it it, it makes me sad. Exactly. So instead of uh, yeah talking about the problems, I believe strongly that we should we should we need to talk about solutions. And that's why, you know, uh, I always think about it positively, how COVID has improved my organization. It, it's, it's a very small organization, but how can we improve the lives of these children and these girls? Um, and that is, you know, through digital platform, through giving them opportunity through online, through which they have actually become a little bit, you have reached to normal population. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you've made an interesting uh, argument about that we have uh, already, the problem is severe, we already know about the problem, but we must think about solutions. And you're talking about digital platforms, which is quite an interesting, uh, particularly in these times, how people are taking advantage of online platforms is remarkable. And, and even right now, we are connected through the online platform. This is how we initiated this program was initiated, in fact, uh, when it all started. So my next question would be for the children, the underprivileged children in particular. Uh, what do you think can be done for them? Like the solutions you've talked about, like what, what solutions do you have in mind? See what, what we are doing as an organization and it, it, it is a purely, you know, it's an initiative which I believe anybody can do because I, I, it was not my field. This is not what I do. 
Uh, I started it and it happened and it, I believe that anybody can do that. So what we do is we pick up these kids from the streets and we try to give them a platform at our foundation to just make them capable of entering into a formal education system. So basically for like, you know, it can be one year, it can be six months, it can be two years, depending on how quick the child can learn. And then we make them enter into formal education system. Like we have an MOU signed with Peshawar Model School and they, they take almost 20 to 25 kids every year. Um, and these are free, free scholarships given to these kids. So um, obviously there are challenges. I, we were just talking about it, that there are challenges once these kids, they enter into the formal education system. Uh, their background is not the same. Uh, the, their parents are mostly uneducated or even if they're educated, they're not interested in their future. They just want them to go out and earn money because uh, 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 you know, they, they, there is poverty, there, there are other problems. So we have to keep in mind that these kids stay in the school, we need to retain them, and then we need to have after school uh, tuition hours for them. Then we have to keep in mind that the environment and their houses and other issues in their houses are solved so that they're in their sane mindset and they're able to study. Uh, you know, that that's sense of security given to these kids so that they can actually focus on, on their studies. So there are so many issues, but then for each and every issue, there is a solution also. Yeah, right. So once again, economics comes into play because obviously economic disparities are there. There's always a class difference and that's the real problem that we're facing. This is socially, social disparities and the class struggle is always there. And no matter which country we live in, but that's always somewhere, someone is already vulnerable and they talk about solutions and they talk about the way forward. And I think this is the way how things should go. Uh, coming back to Dr. Amir Tajsab, and once again, sir, would like to know and discuss uh, further about uh, the academic perspective, like how important are social sciences and humanities, in particularly raising voices for marginalized groups? And do you think that a strong research culture uh, can help somewhere addressing these issues? Do you think that can happen? Like, is it how important is research culture for this? I think your mic needs to be unmuted. I think there's some issue with the mic. Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, yes, I forgot to yes. turn that on. Yes. yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, there's a you know, major uh, role that academia can play uh, in, in terms of resolving this particular issue in, in terms of integrating the you know, marginalized community into the mainstream. Uh, but even here, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, the government policy is quite uh, directionless in, 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 in case of Pakistan. Uh, you must have seen a drastic change in terms of curriculum that we used to study when I was a kid in the school. Uh, so we used to hear from our colleagues that, you know, uh, there were subjects that they used to study in the school. They, they used to study civics as a subject. They used to study archaeology. They used to study drama, poetry. Um, you know, fine arts and stuff like that. But these days, if you come across any any young person, you would hardly find any 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 student who's interested in these disciplines: psychology, applied psychology, drama, theater, art. And these are the type of subjects that we need to you know revive in a, into our into our curriculum, and we must work hard on them. Uh, no doubt, natural sciences are important. Business studies are important, and you know. But, but over here, uh, there's a dearth of, uh, you know, uh, orientation towards these uh, soft subjects, which are equally important. They're important because they have a huge impact on our society. So we must work really hard on, you know, reviving all those kind of subjects and making them, uh, you know, acceptable to our, our, our students so that they adopt and they, you know, get admissions into that, those kind of disciplines and they carry on with that as a, as a, as a career. So yes, that's, uh, you know, um, there, there's a huge potential for our academia and the uh, associated government departments to think on those lines. Yes, I think, I think you made quite an interesting point about the curriculum and overall the reading culture that we used to have when people, when you, whenever you used to go out like 10, 15 years ago, someone would be reading something, someone would be relating, recommending a book. That culture is gone. Even the cafe culture, like there were used to be some famous cafes in Peshawar Shadar where the authors, scholars would come there, discuss their ideas whole day. 
it's going away uh, partly some some accuse the digital platforms for that that did happen because of it but i think it has a lot to do with the overall curriculum the culture the society we live in i think that's even more important that you highlighted a very good point about that now uh, abia <laughs> coming back to again uh, your point is about about the role of communication particularly when we're talking about the special cases uh, do you think more advocacy and awareness is required uh that, that's what i want to know because that's the real problem we face that normally uh, there's a communication problem when it comes to speaking about rights for special people exactly thank you so much yes this is really important the way we are communicating to person with disabilities especially we experienced during the covid response all the information everything was not in accessible formats so we were not able to communicate to persons with disability how they can access to the protection services how they can access to the health uh, provisions of health services so this is really complicated but we um, are trying to make a our policies and strategies more inclusive and especially for children and women and girls with disability was difficult to get the online education because most of the kids they can access but for deaf for the blind people what kind of mechanism they need they always need the sign language interpretation they need the braille material sound descriptions of everything and we uh, have developed one app where we can share that information to the persons with disability in an accessible formats and we are also trying to advocate for all overall like rights how we can see and collaborate with the other organizations on that we were just saying like if we start you know using the sign language everybody cannot understand but they said like it's important to learn the sign language and how we can communicate to deaf people or the other people so we uh, were just trying to link it with the policies and legislation also the recent notification of the supreme court was about the using the right terminology for person with disability by coming person first and then disability so we all are like persons with disability we were using this term but it was not easy to communicate to all the media all the key stakeholders how they can use that so we continuously need the advocacy and the support from the different organizations who can raise this concern and especially from the phone platform where we can see this huge number of phone okay. alumni who are all committed who want to work so they can take the lead and they can be our ambassadors who can talk about the rights of persons with disability in a positive way because we always concerned about disability oh she is disabled she can't do anything or just a problem come in our mind but i feel like disability is just a different lifestyle we have to enjoy the rights on the equal basis with others and i feel very proud of my disability so it's the same like for the community people who can understand and accept the disability and try to live a life which is more inclusive and dignified i think yes and i think another important point particularly from communication perspective and for journalism or for anyone working on this is empathy to walk in their shoes i mean it's important to understand their bit of story because i was covering one story about asanullah who was the champion this, uh, this table table channel uh, champion you might have met him in peshawar is quite famous uh, he was pretty much unknown when we were covering him so we went there we listened to his part of the story for us it was surprising the problems people face the ramps the issues they have related to the privacy and all these things so that was shocking for us but when the story got coverage uh, people started to communicate with him particularly people with problems they started communicating with him they wanted to know how he maintained his life he maintained his health and later on he became a mentor i think that was a great story for us that yes communication plays an important role and particularly it's your story which needs to be heard out that's the important point and empathy is the key for that so thank you very much for sharing some points with us and obviously we move again to uh, mavish and keeping in view uh, her expertise in academia and particularly in dealing dealing with special um, cases uh, re related to school going children uh, what do you think needs to be done at micro and micro le macro level uh, in helping these marginalized children and anything else if you want to uh, which can help the current circumstances um 
Parvez, see, I, I believe uh, my area of expertise is not at a very macro level. I'm not part of government or, uh, you know, that is not my area of expertise. But yes, I can comment on how we can do it at micro level, which I am sure. doing actually. So um, uh, how I, I have started generally youth or youngsters, my students, they generally ask me, ma'am, how did you start it? Because people feel that first step is always very difficult. Then it's fine. Then it starts. Um, I always tell them that, you know, initially I, I have never invested my own money in this foundation that I have. Um, I believe that, you know, I can connect people. Um, the people in my surroundings, for them, donating a little bit of money is not a huge thing. And the people, you know, who are marginalized, who are very vulnerable, I can connect these two people. So if I'm that bridge between them, that is my service, right? So um, um, when I started, I just went to these small markets where these kids used to beg. And I told them, I used to tell them, you know, you have to come to this park where I'm going to teach you. And when they, uh, when initially, in, you know, very first day when I started um, uh, it, I, I got a space in the local government office. Uh, nice of uh, the Na Na then Nazim that he gave me that space. And from the very first day, I got a space where I taught these, started teaching these kids. And I realized that they were not very you know, at, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, on a summer afternoon, they were very sleepy and they were hungry. So first thing I had to feed them. So for the first few weeks, I had to take food and sandwiches from my house to feed them. After that, I realized the number of kids when they were increasing. So I had to ask people to, you know, start donating money so that I can buy juices for them and buy food. And it, it started to happen. From the first day when I had zero kids, and by the end of one month, I had 50, 50 kids out of school, completely pure street children. And all of them were getting food, all of them were getting stationery. I got five to 10 volunteers, everybody, you know, started to join in. So the point of telling you all this is that, you know, once you start actually start thinking about doing something, it is very easy to actually start to happen. Um, and then and nowadays, nowadays, what I have formally designed in my organization is how to involve youth in whatever I'm doing. So what we do is there are underprivileged youth and university students whom we involve in our um, in our organization by paying their uh, tuition fee and telling them to come and teach at our institute for two or three hours every afternoon after their classes. So it's like a you know, win-win situation for them. They teach at our institute. They don't feel we're giving them charity, these students at university. And our kids also get an opportunity to be taught by university students. Who, who belong to the same underprivileged background. So they share the same uh, sort of economic uh, problems and mentality. And that is also very important that they need to understand each other also. I think you made a very good point about micro and because you said that you are working at the micro level so you can talk about it. But I think this is what we even uh, require at the macro level because obviously decentralization or empowering people to do it. That's the important thing. Even the government should look after this, that yes, people are working, they should support and even individuals who are looking that there's some good work going on. Now you can say that you cannot do it on your own. I mean, how, how far you can go with that is impossible because a day would come that the number of students would increase, number of children would increase. You cannot do it from your own pocket all the time. But it's important yeah. that you build a culture, the donation culture, the helping out culture, which is, I mean, which is we are slowly and gradually going into it, but it's not as healthy, but still it's going there. But that needs to be emphasized. And I think that's a very good point, uh, particularly uh, because we are just going round and round before we start questions. There, there are people we, we should, uh, they can put in their questions because in a few minutes time, uh, we will be answering to their questions as well. But meanwhile, we'll be talking about it. But uh, an important point, an important point of concern for us is also that, which also you mentioned that, uh, some university students, the underprivileged students, if we give them some work, they can find out some dignified solution to their problems. I think that's a very important point which can expand on. And uh, Dr. Amir Taj Saab is also from academia, and obviously he understands that. When, when we all go abroad, we see that young students working in McDonald's, working in KFC, working elsewhere, they're trying to fill in the work hours. There are 20 hours of work or 40 hours of work in summers that helps them with their economic issues. But here it, it becomes a class issue because even people from middle class families are quite shy about, uh, they wouldn't be sending their kids to McDonald's or somewhere else where they can work and find a solution to that. I think there's a lot of stigma involved to that. And uh, Dr. Amit Sab can speak about it that how can we overcome this stigma? Because this is problem, people can't afford it, but they would not do it because log kya kahenge. So that's a big problem as well. 
Very true, Ji. I, I totally agree with you. And um, what you've mentioned, there's also a flip side to that. So for instance, uh, on the one hand, we have these uh, charity organizations and uh, civil society organizations, just like the one that is being run by Mahvish, it is doing a wonderful job. But then again, uh, uh, you know, this is not supposed to be something that is left to the social sector, uh, civil society organization altogether. And as far as the stigma is concerned, you're very right. It is so unfortunate that, uh, you know, this is the kind of mentality or thought process or perception that we have developed over here. People are perfectly fine while asking for charity, but if you make them, you know, work in, in, you know, in a restaurant or something, they would feel, you know, uh, a stigma associated with that. So that kind of a culture has to change. Uh, we need to engage our youth in, in, in the so-called blue collar jobs. And they must appreciate the fact that this is how things work out for the students of international universities outside Pakistan. So this is a kind of uh, you know, perception that we need to work on. And we in particular focus on this in our institute. We, we you know, when, when students appear for need-based scholarship interviews, the first thing that we offer them is a kind of a job somewhere that is going to help them part-time job that is going to help them with their finances and you know with their fee or at least with their living expenses so yes that kind of uh, perception has to change and again the buck stops at the academia we are the ones who are actually responsible for it so this is a gradual process by the way i was looking at the questions that you had shared with us earlier and behavioral change i presume is the most difficult task to accomplish uh, when it comes to reforming any society so that's a very difficult task and it cannot be done in, in a day or two. We need to constantly work on that. And that's a very important point. So yes, I totally agree with you. There's you know, the, the sigma, a stigma associated with it. When I went to UK for the first time, I made it a point that I work in one of the restaurants and I clean, uh, you know, cleaned the table. And I thought this is going to help me you know, uh, change my perception about being a, a person who yes. comes from a landlord family. And that has to happen one day. And I'm so proud to share those experiences with my students. You know, I, I didn't need money at that time. I had uh, plenty of money to support my education and all that from my family. But I was so fond of traveling. So I thought I shouldn't be relying on my parents for, you know, my, my, my luxuries. So for that matter, I started working in different restaurants. I, I worked with McDonald's and I worked in different restaurants. And I, I changed my perception. And now I'm trying to, you know, pass on that kind of, uh, you know, exactly. to my students. Yeah. So yes, I totally agree with you. Yes, I think that's very important because the more you interact, the more you travel, the more exposure you have, your vision about life changes as well. And since you've shared, I have also worked as a security guard in London and also as a factory worker where I was just cutting vegetables. First, it was just like quite unbelievable. It just seemed, seemed like a nightmare to me because I could have never imagined I'd be doing these things. But obviously, what it did, it helped me think about people who work in factories, who work on daily wages and what their life is all about. And if people can get rights, basic rights, so they would not be vulnerable enough. Because even as a security guard, if you can get a card, if you, if you can work as a factory worker, you can have the basic necessities, then you're not vulnerable anymore. So there's a structural problem to it. There's a lot True. of structural administrative issues that needs to be addressed. And that's very important. And now we... Uh, we'll ask questions from Abia as well, that how important is the role of uh, digital platforms? How much uh, strength it has given you, uh, in particularly reaching out and uh, doing advocacy and obviously spreading awareness? I would like to know about the digital platform that has helped you, Abia. Yes, really. thank you so much. Um, yes, for the digital platform, it's really important. I would say like for the non-disabled people, maybe it's a luxury, but for person with disability, it's a need because without the digital platform, they were not able to communicate. I'll just give you an example, like a deaf and a blind people, they both need to communicate with each other. And the only solution is the digital platform. They can, you can send the message to the blind people and they can use the software to listen the voice. So that kind of communication skills we have developed to person with disability. And also I feel like 
this is important in this time because we use the social media and all the important platforms for a person raising awareness about the disability about their rights and how they can engage because we were talking about the employment opportunities and the micro financing and giving the most opportunities for person with disabilities but they cannot go outside and they were finding it all the physical infrastructural barriers but in the digital world we can make softwares we can make um, environment more accessible and they can easily use that um and especially when we were like connecting recently we are conducting a training of 100 women with disability on their electoral processes on that advocacy platform and that was really important for them to understand the need of the digital platform and how to use it their capacity building on that and then they were able to like make all the training programs accessible and also this is really important for all of us to use in this era that we can yes. uh, and yeah. and obviously uh, this is a broader area to speak about that we have lots of vulnerable sections obviously vulnerable groups there are many we have transgender we have asset burn issues we have people with serious concerns of forced marriages and obviously this is all we're talking this relates this concerns every vulnerable group that we're talking about the risk assessment how it can be handled uh I'll be asking Mavish that what, how do you see, particularly being a woman, and the challenges one faces when, especially starting initiatives like Rana, uh, how how challenging it is for a woman to go and start off this, particularly when you know that uh, the culture is conservative, there can be issues, there can be problems. Uh, how how do you see that? Are are things changing? Um, well, always gen generally I'm asked this question, and um, I. I you know it makes me think of what were my challenges and it's so surprising to actually feel that i never faced any challenges it was always very i i think it was always very easy for me to do whatever i wanted to do and there is a very strong reason behind it i always feel that um, a strong education or my background you know as uh, as my education was always a very important reason it gave me confidence uh, apart from that the family background and the support from my parents or my my husband or then my in-laws it was always there so i strongly believe a strong family support is something which gives you a lot of confidence in doing whatever you feel like then you do not care about what other people say or think that builds up your personality uh, thirdly i also strongly believe women support women if if women support women which generally you know is missing unfortunately in our society i'm not saying every woman is like that but generally uh, if that support is there it gives you such such immense strength um, i still remember when i came up with this idea yeah, that i want to teach a child one child uh, i went to my mother in law's room I, i asked her i want to do this but you know obviously i don't have a space so i have to start it in a park and i want i don't i'm not comfortable going there alone so will you accompany me and she said why not let's do it i'm good in urdu you'll do you do ling english and you know we'll start doing it so now i feel that if that support would not have been there i would not have been able to start it so i mm -hmm. believe that supportive environment is always something which is it should be there yes definitely and uh, dr amir tasha uh, particularly talking about the some of the more vulnerable groups like transgender groups that we often see what do you think is the major policy that needs to be devised because what we see is normally uh, there, there is still a lot of gap when it comes to implementing policies that address issues related to particular transgender forced marriages and issues like that so uh, how do you think that at local level particularly in pakhtunkhwa and elsewhere and obviously in pakistan at micro level what can be done about it this is one of the you know um, aspect of our social vulnerability where i think our our society has done well as compared to the rest of the developed countries i would say so for instance this inclusion of uh, transgender their their sex being mentioned as transgender in national id card is one of the significant developments in this particular aspects i didn't see it anywhere abroad i didn't see this kind of uh, you know legislation passed in any of the regional or national level government even in uk or in america 
But uh, then again, when it comes to the practical implications of such uh, issues, social issues, we are far behind the you know required uh, type of uh, you know milestones. I would say, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, it, it it is all totally dependent on how we educate our society. It's not just literacy that we need to you know ensure. It's the education. And through the schools and through the you know basic education institutions that can even include informal education institutions such as madrasas or public schools or private schools, that is where we need to um, you know inculcate this kind of a culture and this acceptance for differently abled people, transgenders or you know be that uh, physically disabled people, be that uh, I don't know other vulnerable groups in a society. So, uh, unfortunately, the only solution or, you know, the difficult task is to uh, sensitize our society. And the best uh, stage at any person's life is at that basic education level. Once the damage is done at the basic education level, it is quite difficult for us to, you know, rectify that damage at a higher education institution level. So when we get students, for example, I, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in general conversation with my colleagues, I tell them that you know, it, it becomes quite difficult for us to mend the, that kind of a thought process or mentality uh, if, if we get them at the age of, uh, I don't know, maybe 18 or 20 years old people. This is something that was supposed to be uh, taken care of while they were in their schools or colleges. So uh, that is the, you know, the, the, the level where we, we should focus on. Yes, I think, uh, yes. Uh, so if there is any, if people are watching, obviously uh, people have joined us on the page. There's uh, Kinza, Aurangzeb, Hussain, Ahmed, and they're all watching us. And Kinza has also said that, uh, Amit, uh, sir, my situation is the same like you when you're talking about that uh, you experience the work you did. And she said that, I think it's uh, the big folk, that's a big concern. So I think, yes, uh, the stigma is there. The issues are there. Obviously, we need to talk about it. But obviously, an important point that you just made is the sensitivity, the sensitization that needs to be done. And I think, it, once again, obviously, economic disparity is a concern. But along with that, the reading culture, the education, the literature that's gone, I think that's another point because you cannot become sensitive in a vacuum. You need to read something. You need to read people like Manto or someone like Rabindra Nartego to understand a feministic perspective, how things go, or some like, I don't understand a kid's mind, read Charles Dickens, or for example, the orphan children, if you want to understand, I think Charles Dickens um, uh, literature gives you a lot of idea about what happens to orphans in Oliver Twist and something like that. But what is happening is that our children, when you ask them stories today, they hardly know anything and they're, not, they're getting far away from literature and culture. Even in some elite families, maybe people have access to good books, but obviously when you go down the stream, where the economic disparities are there and the children who cannot afford expensive schools. Obviously, that's another big concern that what they have to read. And curriculum, again, once again, plays an important role. So, Mavish, how important do you think is curriculum uh, in shaping our worldview? And how important is literature connected to that? That's, that's I think, very, very important. Um, I cannot emphasize much more on that. It is actually very important. Um, uh, recently, I'm in touch with, with, uh, with somebody from Karachi when we're working on a book club so that my kids are, are, are going to, are supposed to read certain books and they're, then they're going to discuss those books with, with kids uh, globally. So it's going to be a sort of a global reading activity. And I, it was actually very challenging to choose children from my institute who could actually read those books like, like Kite Runner or, you know, at that, uh, you know, you, they had to have some sort of reading capability to read those books. Um, and my kids, they, they, they start from ABC. So I had to keep in mind, how can they read those books? So, um, but I, I told my, my team was not very, you know, supportive or were very encouraging that how are we going to go ahead with this activity? But I told them that, you know, we have to make it happen. Whatever, however, I don't know, but we are, we are going to choose the elder kids and we're going to work on it. So you have to encourage, you have to have uh, uh, such activities and it's all about being a role model also uh, and, and the opportunities and facilities should be given to them. Uh, I have a very small setup, the, the, the foundation that I have, but I have still made a small reading corner in, in my foundation so that the kids have this concept of what a library is or, or what is a reading corner and they can, you know, go and the way it, 
to use a library and how to use the books although they have laptops they have access to internet but it, you know they need to be taught what books are and how to read them also mm -hmm. it is very important yes, yes uh, you are right that we can't emphasize more and uh, abia i would like to also know from uh, your perspective on this like obviously in order to understand the special needs of special people how much literature is there available i mean do we have to sensitize people about uh, disabilities and issues and do you have something about that in our curriculum in our literature to understand the needs of special people yeah because we like i studied in the special education center and then moved to mainstream school and we find a huge gap between the both because the, our literature or our like syllabus is not that much inclusive and not highlighting the persons with disabilities concern we like i am the first shivning scholar i studied in uk and at that time i was doing a research on the disability in pakistan and it was so difficult for me to get the literature on the disability movement from the human rights perspective we only got the literature related to the rehabilitation or the uh, charity based model but not on the right based approach and how we are seeing the positive image of the person with disabilities in the world development so that kind of literature is completely missing and we really need to work on that we were working with the howard university and some other institutes in the us because they have very good disability departments and they are taking disability as a course so why not we can introduce that in some of our um, local universities who can talk about the disability and development and take the disability as a course so students can do the research and in their research projects they can talk from the social perspective from the medical perspective and then from the social like right based approach so in that way we can get more literature on disability and we can spread that message to everyone and i feel also on the media it's very important where they are highlighting the concerns of persons with disability so they can use that literature in their observance and using the languages they are and the terminologies i remember we were having one once on the 8th march international women day we collected the stories of 10 women with disability amazing women with disability but when it comes to the printing and publishing on the day the heading was broken bodies but beautiful souls so we were all like shocked like we are not going to use this we are persons with disabilities and it's very important like how people are using the right technology or that's only possible when we have the literature available for them the information access and where they can get uh, more opportunities there Yes. So I think mean, yes, it's it's very very important, especially sensitization, understanding them, and obviously we have talked about the economic disparities, we've talked about social disparities, we've talked about stigma, and obviously understanding them is the key. And one thing that's just left towards the end, I think, importantly, we have to think about the local context as well, because most of the things, most of the times when we devise policies or anything that is related to transgender, special people, or people with the issues that concern our local uh, local context that's sometimes missing and sometimes when we borrow policies that's from the other region that's becoming problematic so dr ramit that's up how important is local context in this regard because obviously it's for the people for the place and who are already suffering who are already going through vulnerability local context plays an important role what do you say about that um you know that these perceptions that we've been talking about they're quite entrenched they're quite embedded in a sense that uh, it's not a problem of pakistan only i i had a chance to visit uh, multiple countries in in south asia so i was in nepal and there uh, while talking to some of my uh, you know colleagues over there they said that uh, over here if if a child is born with a disability locally uh, you know the people consider that probably it is some kind of uh, you know punishment to the parents because for, for their wrong doings and that is how god has uh, somehow punished them by you know uh, making them parents of a person with a physical disability 
these are all cultural and somehow uh, you know uh, associated with uh, religion as well multiple uh, versions of religions as well so these are the type of perceptions that are embedded for, for like centuries i'm not too pessimistic about the scenario because gradually we are coming out of it but expecting a, an overnight change and you know uh, considering that things are going to be perfectly all right in in a in a decade or so i think that is a you know too 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 much um, ambitious kind of uh, i would say expectation but things are changing and uh, in in south asian perspective as i said you know things are you know culturally embedded and entrenched so uh, we are working on that and you know one day um, we will we, we are at least in the right direction so people are at least start uh, you know they've started talking about it i i usually quote this example you know probably 10 years ago we couldn't even talk about breast cancer for example as as one of the important medical issues now this is something very important but probably a couple of years ago we had a seminar about breast awareness uh, you know uh, campaign in our own institute now, i think of it as a huge change of of acceptance of uh, uh issues that used to be considered as you know taboo so far but uh, i believe this is a great progress that we've started talking about it our problem is i i totally agree with mavish she said we you know we we've talked a lot about the problems we all know about the problems so let's move on and you know start doing something yes. about it that's the problem that's with our society is that we have we have a kind of a makeshift approach towards solving any issue so as i said mavish is doing a wonderful job by by running that uh, school and it is quite an established one right now but uh, do you have any I idea how many exactly you know exactly that, that's you. that's so, okay so yes yeah so i mean obviously we are running short on time so i think this it was Sorry. great having your perspective from all of you it was really i mean uh, just open a lot of new areas to talk about it was great having perspective from different segments of society different expertise and obviously before closing i would just like to share comment of masood ahmed who was posted on pawn page that i am working with an ngo working with orphans and marginalized groups our corporate institutions should have a broader csr policy and uh, th that's what he's talking about that the true proper csr initiatives Uh, i believe that a large segment of we can streamline marginalized segments so thank you for joining us and all those who have been with us today um, really great to have attended our session it was great uh, and once again thank you very much uh, dr anil taj saab uh, mavish thank, thank you. you and abira thank you very much for coming it was great having your perspective and hopefully we'll connect in future to talk about more avenues and obviously uh, the vulnerable groups the marginalized groups is something that cannot be uh or done in just one sessions and one webinar it's it's a constant struggle everyone is putting their effort whether they are in academia whether they are in social sector development sector a lot more effort needs to be put because this is what uh true progress is that bringing minds from different spaces and uh, that's what we are looking forward to so thank you very much uh, i hope that uh, day comes that economic disparities and all these things just go away and there's a classless society where everyone can thrive and obvious literature prevails in the end so let's hope for that Thank you very much. Uh we'll be Thank looking you. forward to more sessions. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Take you. care.